I would like to start with the words of um, um, the French traveler Victor Guerin, who, um, this is how he uh, ends the description of the Battle of Chitin after visiting the Chitin Plain, or the Hatin Plain, at 1875. And it's a, very, it's a very interesting text because this is it's to transmit the, the idea that I would like to, uh, to talk to you about during this, uh, this lecture. A year after the end of this decisive battle, the Isle of Hatin and its plain were still marked by the defeat. In every step made, human bones were crushed. Even today, after many hundreds of years, I was told by the people of Hatin, the village, that the blade of the plow often cut through human bones, bones that originate, no doubt, in the terrible massacre that occurred on those plains, cursed in Christian memory. Now, this is a very uh, strong text, a very strong de description, and, and a very uh, uh, stimulating one in a way, uh, but it also uh, provokes uh, the questions that I would like to raise. And it provokes the question because if you look at this, uh, this is after a very short uh, visit of, of this traveler at the site. And it provokes questions which relate both to the memory of historical texts and also uh, the archaeology. What are, are there any, is there any evidence for that battlefield, for that famous battlefield that I will, I will give you a briefing in a moment. Don't worry, I won't, I won't keep you there. Uh, I know that some of you um, might have heard or maybe know quite a lot about the Battle of Chitin, but I, I will talk about this in a, in a moment. What I would like uh, to say now is that the memory of historical event, the people of Chatin, the people of the village of Chatin, are pointing their fingers on the bones which might relate to the people who fought that battle 750 years earlier. 750 years earlier. Now, is this possible? Could there be an archaeological remain who would survive on those fields for such long? <coughs> on the other hand, you have the people of the village of Chatin who remember or they who cherish the memory, the, hist the historical memory of that event. So you see that such an event, which is in, a la in the landscape, can be, um, uh, you can still find its signature in the memory, in the cultural memory of people around. Now, <coughs> it's very interesting. I've, I brought this photograph. It's one of the earliest photographs that were taken in, uh, taken in, uh, in Israel, in Palestine of that time. Um, at uh, the middle, uh, it, it was taken by Mendel Dines at the uh, 1850s, uh, about 1855, I would say, or so. The people that you see over here are Bedouins of the, of the Nadi tribe, the Nadi tribe. And in 1857, a few years before Victor Guerin arrived to the plain of Hatin, they had a battle on those fields that they are taking, their photograph is being taken here. And in that battle, 300 uh, um, horsemen from that uh, tribe were fighting 400 horsemen, Othman or horsemen. And those people from that tribe won. So I wonder, and over 90 Othmans were killed, never to be buried on those same fields. So I wonder whether Guerin really understood when he was interviewing the people of Hatin, maybe they were talking about a battle, but they were not really talking about the Battle of Chitin, but on another Battle of Chitin. Now, in the Levant, <laughs> there's no uh, shortage in uh, conflicts of different degrees and characters. Many of those conflicts have been studied archaeologically. Um, uh, hideout complexes, for instance, we have uh, many, um, uh, oh, it's, a little, it's, it's been cut a little bit over there, but this is a, a wonderful photograph of Mats Mesada in the background, in the, in, uh, in the background, and here you can see one of the Roman, Roman camps. So archaeological studies were conducted on, and, uh, mil on military archaeology in terms of um, military camps, hideout complexes like the ones from Bar Kokhva, or siege warfare. The siege warfare, for instance, from Lachish from 701, or siege warfare which relates to crusader battlefield, uh, crusader uh, sites, for instance. But there's one kind of battlefield, or one kind of uh, of conflict arena that was never studied, was never studied archaeologically. And when I started this project, um, I'd say about 10 years ago, I was surprised that there is nobody has ever conducted a battlefield archaeology uh, study in Israel, which is, can be named as 
the land of conflicts. We had so many conflicts, so many battles. I can name about five different confli conflicts that happened only on those fields that you see in the background. None of them have been studied. And I remember myself coming as a kid, standing at the horns of Chitin, and you can see the volcano in the background. We, we used to have tours there, you know, like, you know, children, uh, uh, you would take us uh, in school buses, you know, <laughs> to stand on the horns of Chitin, we would hear the names uh, that I will, uh, I will mention in a moment. Uh, very, very stimulated stories about knights, about chivalry, about there's even a maiden uh, in distress in that, in that story. Uh, but I was intrigued when I started working on my PhD or thinking about what should I study, that not a single art, uh, artifact which relates to this historical event was ever found. So that gave me an opportunity to hunt for those artifacts but it also gave me an opportunity to develop a research framework for the archaeology of conflict. And I will talk about this in a moment because archaeology of conflict is, is much more complicated than one might think. It's not enough to go out with a metal detector as people might be doing uh, uh, in, such, uh, in such studies. It needs to be thought of carefully. And I will continue a little bit. So, I promised you some background on the Battle of Hattin. So the Battle of Hattin took place in, at the uh, 3rd and 4th of July, 1187. Um, and we're talking about, usually when you look, when you, when you open um, historical books which, which uh, uh, deal with the time of the Crusades or actually in any, any conflicts, any battlefields, you would see things like this. Many times you would have a map a topographical map with arrows pointing in different directions. People, this force went this way, this force that, that went that way. And for me, it seemed a little bit not enough. Isn't this map a little bit too abstract? What about the different archaeological feature? What about the different um, uh, buildings, uh, road systems? It things needs to be added to this, uh, uh, to all this, uh, all this information. So I thought to myself. How do I contri contribute really archaeologically, not just finding the arrowheads? How do I really reconstruct the way that the battlefield looked or the battlefields look in different periods years ago? How do I do it? And this is what uh, brought me to, uh, to think about this, uh, um, this idea. Now, since I was the first one to, uh, to do this uh, 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 in my region, then I had to pick, I could pick any battlefield that I wanted. So, obviously pick something that was uh, close to my heart, Crusader archaeology. So um, it was a good opportunity. A little bit about, about, about the numbers. The Crusaders, also we, we prefer to call them Franks uh, uh, in, that, in that period. It's, it, we, it's, it's a much more uh, common uh, 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 term that we use. We're talking about 1,200 uh, mounted knights, heavily armed mounted knights, and about between 5,000 to, to 7,000 uh, sergeants, which, which basically we're talking about infantry men. The Muslims, on the other hand, you can see that the ratios are much, are much bigger. Over. We're talking about 12,000 12, mounted archers. They also have some heavily armed knights, very similar to the, to the knights. Very similar to the knights. Those would, would be the ones guarding, guarding the uh, um, um, uh, Saladin or, or the, the, main, uh, the main leaders. And we estimate the numbers, the number of infantry in this battle around between 20 to 24,000 infantry men. So you can already see that the ratios here are quite substantially different. Now, this is not surprising. This is for the 88 years before the Battle of Chitin that the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem existed, that was always, always the situation. The Franks, the Crusaders, were always a minority but they had a very special fighting technique that allowed them to survive for such, uh, for such a long time. But something happened on that day in Chitin, which basically um, um, annihilated their forces. Now, finally, I get to the, to the battle itself. So the Hatin campaign was part of a jihad war declared on the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem years before. 
shortly after the First Crusade and the conquer of Jerusalem at the end of the First Crusade at 1099, at 15 of, the, of July 1099. Now, those of you who are interested, I'll be talking in Shimon's class on Wednesday specifically about the archaeological and historical aspects of that event this Wednesday. So, if you're not getting, uh, uh, if I'm not too much for you uh, right now, you're more than welcome to, to, join, to join me at Shimon's class as well. Late June, 1187, we're jumping 88, 88 years forward. The Muslims cross the Jordan River in a place called Sanbara. It's just over here. And they place, them, they place themselves over a dominant point along the Seferi Tiberias Road. Now, why the Seferi Tiberias Road? Because the, the Franks, the Crusades, the Crusaders, the moment the Muslims are coming in, they also have their encampments, they have their gathering points, and their gathering, point, governing, um, gathering points is at Seferi, at the springs of Seferi. It's because there are meadows over there, which is very good for grazing, there's a lot of water, and this is a very good gathering point uh, for them. So Saladin, the ruler of the Muslims, he takes his men and he positions them along this road. He is starting to skirmish, he is starting to go around the Galilee, That's a wonderful photograph by uh, Richard Cleave. And Saladin already positioned himself on Mount Tabor. Uh, he provokes the Crusaders. He's trying to draw them out from, from the springs of Seferi. And he's doing it. One of the provocations that he's doing is going up to Mount Tabor and his men are burning the, uh, the monastery uh, which was there, trying to bring the Crusaders out from their stronghold, trying to bring them out from the water, trying to draw them towards a land which he controls with all, all those people. Now you can see a wonderful, uh, in this wonderful photograph, you can also see the Arbel Valley. This is, of course, Chitin again, Mountain Chitin, and this would be the Chitin Plain. This is the area that we're talking about. This is the main area of the battlefield. Oops, that wasn't my intention. On the 2nd of July, and this is where the, uh, the prince is, uh, the, is coming in, um, Saladin sends one of his forces to conquer to Tiberias and to, pl to place its castle under siege. Now, he's, not taking, he's taking the city, but he's not taking the castle, because in the castle there is a woman. That woman is the princess of the Galilee. Her name is Ashiv, and her husband, the prince of the Galilee, Raymond of Tripoli, is in Seferi with the king, with the crusader king, Gide Lezignan. So he tries to draw them out again from Seferi. Now, the crusaders are battling between themselves whether they should set out to free Tiberias. The king is in favor of going out towards uh, Tiber to, to Tiberias, but what would be Raymond of Tripoli's advice? His wife is there in the Galilee. Well, someone would like to guess? <laughs> well, I'll cut it short, he's saying, we shouldn't go there. Listen, I'm in good terms with Saladin. I know we will free her, and we have a problem. All the way between here, between Seferi and Tiberias, we don't have any water sources. This is what he says to him, at least, uh, at least according to one of the sources who was written by one of his men. Okay? Of course, there are sources in the opposition, we say, would suggest otherwise that he gave, he gave some other, that his advice wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, uh, a good one. This provocation, he convinces uh, the king, uh, Guido Lezignan, um, uh, to call um, his men. And very, uh, very late, on the 2nd of, uh, of July, 1187, he is telling his men that he, they should dress up. And you can see some photographs from uh, a reenactment which is being done on a yearly basis in the past uh, six years. They're dressing up, and early in the morning, on the 3rd of July, uh, 1187, they are starting to march. The crusaders are moving towards Tiberias. Now, the techniques that they are, that they are using is calling a fighting march a fighting march. They're basically taking the crusader castle and they're just moving it, in the, they're moving a crusader uh, castle in the landscape. Now, how do they do that? The way that they do it is they separate themselves into three forces, three different forces, and each one of those forces, the main body of arms, of, uh, of armed knights, is circled by rings of defense 
of archers and infantrymen. This way, each one of the forces can move independently, and the archers are basically, their work is to distance the skirmishing the, uh, of, the mounted, uh, of the mounted archers, the Muslim mounted marches. The pace was very slow and were made in the, in the basically the movement was made in the pace of the infantry because, because of that, uh, that obvious thing. When they reached a place called Maskana, which you can see just over here, the rear guard was attacked, and which was led by the hospitalers and, and, uh, and one of the uh, princes, which was called Balian of, of Iblin, retreated, retreated, as uh, the Mon Monty Python would say, he bravely ran away <laughs> from, uh, from the scene. So that's, uh, he retreated. But we've already, we're on the first day of the battle, and already we lose we lost uh, uh, one of the main forces. So we are left with two, with two of the forces. The fighting didn't end at the evening of, uh, of, the, 3rd of, uh, of the 3rd of July. The, the Franks decided to camp around Maskana, known for a big seasonal pool that, uh, that was there. They camped there over the night, but the Muslims kept harassing them throughout the whole night. So it means they never, most of the knights couldn't get off their horses. Just think about it. They were already, they haven't drunk for the whole day, and then they have to continue fighting throughout the night. On the other hand, the Muslims con con brought convoys of provisions of water from surrounding cisterns, and from the Sea of Galilee, which was under their control. And also they, bo they bought convoys of uh, arrowheads. We know we're speaking about thousands of, uh, of, uh, of arrowheads that were brought over that night. So the fighting didn't stop. And the next morning, on the 4th of July, this is a little bit to, uh, uh, to give you the... <laughs> um, Balu and Iblin retreated, I've said that already, and uh, they're camping in Maskana. Um, the next morning, um, after they haven't drunk for the, for the whole day and the night, the Franks continue on the march, and now, now there's a big question. Whether they were aiming still to Tiberias, or whether they tried to reach one of the springs, which is down here in the Arbel Valley, just by Chitin, just by the horns of Chitin. We don't really know whether they tried to reach Tiberias on that day, or they have tried to reach uh, Hatin on, uh, on the springs of Hatin on that day. The march was slow, and we don't we don't really know uh, about, uh, or at least we didn't we didn't know the locations of the different events that happened on that day. What, but we did know. We know that at a certain point, the Muslims burned the fields around the, the Crusaders. This is one thing. Another another point that we don't really know of is that at a certain point. The, uh, the infantry fled, left the main body of arms, and left and, and basically fled towards the horns. They, found, they tried to find uh, uh, high grounds. And then, um, um, at a certain point, there was a very, very, very interesting uh, event. Raymond of Tripoli, because he was the Prince of the Galilee, it was his land, basically, so he was leading. He got the honor. Uh, to charge against, uh, against the Muslim force led by Salah Adin's nephew, Taki Adin. So Raymond of Tripoli is getting the honor, he is gathering his knights, the infantry move aside, and he is starting to charge. And he is charging against the Muslims, but instead of the two forces colliding, the Muslim force opens up. And Raymond's troops just go right through them, never and returning, and the Muslims s close behind them. <coughs> And Raymond never comes back to the battlefield. Now, remember that he had some good relations with, uh, with Salah Adin. This is another point where he was accused. I will, the result of my studies, I can actually tell you where would be the only place where such a maneuver could have been done. Um, so, um, the Muslim victory is marked by the capture of the, uh, of by the fall of the king's Red, uh, red tent, which was stationed just under the, under the horns of Chitin, his imprisonment, the massacre of the Hospitaller and Templar knights, the beheading of Renaud de Chatillon. Renaud de Chatillon was the prince of Karak, and he was Saladin's worst enemy uh, because he used to attack convoys uh, on their way to Mecca. On one of those convoys was Saladin's sister. 
So he was a, it was a personal uh, revenge that was done against uh, this man. But the most catastrophic thing that happened of that day, and this is, if you remember, I go back to Garen, the curse, the curse, this is why the, the, this, the Hatin plain is cursed in Christian memory, is the cap capture of the relic of the true cross. Now you can see over here, this is, I've cut off from, a, this is a manuscript that you can find in Oxford. It's a 13th century manuscript which described the capture of the true cross, the relic of the true cross. This is, by the way, Salah Hadin. Here, he is the one taking the cross. For some reason, they gave him the, the, the guy who, who did the manuscript, Matthew Paris, he gave him, put a, a, a similar crown to the one that Richard the Lion held would have, because he didn't really know how uh, Salah Adin should have looked. But this is the most uh, traumatic thing that happened on that day. The relic of the true cross came with the crusaders to the battlefield as uh, a, a trophy, as something uh, that would help them win. You know, it's as if, it, it was as if God, God himself or Jesus himself was, was present on that, on, that, on that day with them. This is what it symbolized to them. And the capture of that relic was really traumatic. It was that traumatic that this is how Richard the Lionheart, uh, um, uh, Troubadour, uh, Amborage, the famous Amborage, describe the disaster. And I will call it, and I will try to do it uh, uh, in an ordinary fashion. Disaster of such dreadful weight brought grief to people small and great throughout the world and lord and hind few knew were comfort they might find then stilled was joy and word and tongue stilled was the dancing hushed the song and hushed the joy and hushed the myth of christian folk throughout the earth now it's nice isn't it <laughs> the news about chitin reached um, europe and it was the direct cause of the death of Pope Urban III. Urban III, when he heard the news, he died from a heart attack. And it was also the main incentive for the Third Crusade to get to go to, to, be, to be set out. And the Third Crusade was probably, after the First Crusade, was the biggest one. It was the, the known as the Crusade of the, of the Three Big Kings. It was Richard the Lionheart was actually the smallest one of uh, the German uh, 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 Friedrich Barbarossa uh, and, uh, and Philip Auguste, uh, the French. The three of them set out on the Third Crusade uh, in order to retake Jerusalem that had been fallen after the battle, but mainly to retrieve the True Cross. That was the aim of the Third Crusade, to retrieve the relic of the True Cross. So it was thus disastrous uh, for people at that time. Now, as I've said, um, the Battle of Chitin has intrigued many people in the past. It's a, I think uh, that you can hardly find people who haven't heard the name Chitin, or haven't heard, haven't know something about what happened on, on that day. And many, it's also, of course, was a stimulator for many scholars to study it. And it was studied firmly. The different sources were studied very, studied uh, in a very firm way, but no archaeological find. Uh, uh, a study was ever conducted on, on this battlefield that you see, that you see in front of you, uh, and neither on any other battlefield. Now, the question that I've asked myself, and he, now I'm coming into the framework that I'm basically, I've presented and, uh, and, and implied on those fields for, for several years, um, is this. Can, can, we, can we go with the metal detector, basically, looking for arrowheads, looking for for coins, looking for artifact, would this be enough for something uh, for studying a battlefield? Uh, there are battlefield archaeological studies which are done, and I'm not, and and some of them are done in a very very good fashion. But I wanted to to try to look at things in a more philosophical way, and mainly to present to people who are doing battlefield archaeology to show them how uh, complicated is the work that they are doing. It's not just about going out to the field trying to find artifact, and I'll show you why. First of all, we should ask several questions. I've, I've shown you on the map, the, the Battle of Chitin is placed on an area of 20, I'd say 20 miles, 20 by four miles, something like this. It's a vast area. Can we call this an archeological site? 
Can we call this? We're talking about almost all the central Galilee. Is this is the Battle of Chitin an archaeological site? How would you define the boundaries of this site? This is one thing. Now, archaeologists such as myself and, and others who are here present, there's one thing that we really like. We like destruction layers. <laughs> destruction layers are giving us, I know it's you know, sort of, a, we have this thing. They are giving us uh, a point in time which we can actually say, this is, you see that layer of ash? This is from a specific event. This is a specific event. Now, we found those, we we're finding those destruction layers usually in stratified urban um, um, archaeological sites where someone came to a city, conquered it, it was burned or abandoned, things fell down, and then this destruction la layer is being preserved. Here we have the chance to find 701 Lachish, for instance, the Assyrian siege of Lachish, or we have or 1271 uh, Mamluk siege of Montfort. We have, we have an opportunity to do this, but on a vast field like this, how can we find a destruction, a destruction with no destruction layer? How, do we, how can we make this, uh, uh, this happen? How does one study archaeologically a site or dispersed site of such, a, of, such a, of, of such a size? But it's even more. I see archaeology as time thinking, as, as many archaeologists do. How do you, we usually we deal with, with long duration, you know, between the Crusaders and Ayyubid and the Mamluks. We're talking about sometimes hundreds of years. Sometimes we have even thousands of years between one, season, between one, uh, one uh, period to another. How do we target the 4th of July, 1187, on such, on such a sightless site? So, my idea was, but there, uh, so the way we do it, we do it through battlefield archaeology, and I've brought, and this is just one of the studies that, that was done, the Battle of, uh, of Culloden in, uh, in Scotland, and you can see Tony Pollard over here, and uh, uh, some of you might, might know Doug Scott, who, who studied the Battle of Little Bighorn, did an, an amazing work over there. And basically, he is the, he's the founder of battlefield archaeology, but still, Structurally, we need to look at this as a, as a, as a big, we have here a, a something, a, a bigger, uh, I'd say, challenge than one would think. Oh, what happened? No. So, um, this is someone I really like, uh, Collingwood. He was an archaeolo ar archaeologist, an English archaeologist, who specialized on, on Roman Britain, but he was also, he was mainly a philosopher. And he said the next, uh, the next thing, history books begin and end, but the events they describe do not. History books begin and end, but the events they describe do not. And we can understand his, uh, his words in two ways, archaeologically and in terms of, uh, of a memory. Archaeologically, the landscape of, of Chitin or the battlefield of Chitin and other battlefields kept on changing from the moment the troops left the fields. It's dynamic. You have animals coming in. You have, look at those, those are trenches dug in 1948 by, by the Israeli um, uh, Defense Force on the northern horn of Chitin, on the northern part of, uh, of the vulca volcano. Here, this all, er all area of coaxial field system is to be changed, is to be, is to be developed. So there is development which is happening, there is, there is change which is happening. How do we monitor this change? In terms of the memory, already Kitchener, Horatio Kitchener, uh, during the Odin Survey of Palestine, um, uh, and had noticed that some of the fields next to Chitin, for instance, one of the fields is called Ard el Burnus, Ard el Burnus. La Burnus is prince in Arabic, land of the prince. And he's going to the people, the villagers of Hittin, and he's asking him, who is this uh, prince? And they tell him, what do you mean? It's the man that lost his head. That's the prince, the prince of Karak, the man that, uh, that Salah ad um, uh, killed or revenged at the end of, uh, of the battlefield. But there are other things which are even more, uh, more amazing. In terms of the battlefield, you see, the person over there is Yosef Margalit. He is an IDF missing in action sh shoulder, soldier who died on a battle which happened at the horns of Chitin. Now, the Palestinian uh, 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 villagers 
who defended their houses in 1948 in the Israeli independence war, they've decided to go up to the horns of Chitin, both because, because this would be strategi strategically the right thing to do, but also because of the memory of the great battle that happened there. So we still have this man missing in action, but there's something even more amazing. On one of the maps of the landscape of Chitin, we have different names for different fields, and look at this one. One of the fields is called Ard Maktal El Nasara, which translates the land where we massacred the Christians. Up to 1948, this is a map from 1938, but up to 1949 actually, on maps from 1949, still those fields were named the land where we massacred the Christians. Amazing, so the memory in the landscape can be preserved. On the other hand, there are some things that we are might trying to forget sometimes. You have, look at this uh, photograph of Dalman from 1908, and it's written over here, you see the horns of Chitin in the background, and over here it's written Mount Beatitudes. Mount of Beatitudes. Pilgrims, Christian pilgrim, pilgrims throughout the 19th and most of the 20th century mm. used to come to the horns of Chitin, identifying the horns of Chitin as Mount Beatitudes. This would be the main site, but now, when people are coming to pilgrimage to, to Israel, to the Holy Land, they're going to the northern part of the Kinneret, northern part of the Sea of Galilee, not to the horns of Chitin. I believe that there were two traditions, and the more people understood there is a, a contradiction between this is where Jesus gave uh, one of his, may maybe even the most important of his uh, of his speeches, of his talks. Uh, this is where, in many ways, uh, the church was founded, isn't it, James? In, and, but also, this is the place where the most important relic, might be the most important relic, the relic of the Greek cross, was lost. So I think there was a sort of a contradiction here that at least in the early 20th century, people really couldn't really uh, cope with. So one, so the tradition which relates to the northern part of the Sea of Galilee, became a little bit uh, stronger. Now, so what I'm saying, in order to find those arrowheads, in order to find the artifacts uh, related to, the, uh, uh, to a specific event, we need to have three types of data. The first type of data that we need to consider is the environmental one, the structural one, the way that the, the landscape is formed. Then, of course, we have the text. We cannot, we cannot we wouldn't know anything about the Battle of Chitin or any other historical event if we didn't have the text. And only then you can imply, you can try basically to add the archaeology into this. And the way that it works, the way that it works in the field is from the structural through the cultural through the event himself. Structural, and I've taken here um, uh, a model which, is, uh, uh, which was presented by uh, 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 the Annals School of Thought, the, uh, the, Anna, the French Annals School of Thought of how uh, uh, s um, um, uh, landscape develop and how, and how different cultures develop from the structural all the way one to the, from the short, from the long durée all the way to the short durée. Meaning that in order to understand this event, you need to study the structural uh, things which relate to the topography road system, water system, things like this. Then you need to put on, on this cultural elements which relates to terracing, which relates to, uh, uh, um, to different uh, 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 installations in the field. And only then you can try and search the event itself. So basically what I'm doing in my study, and I've done this in Chitin and I've also done it on some other crusader battlefield, is to, re to do a landscape reconstruction. And I reconstruct the landscape to different periods. And I can tell you, that in the Roman period, this landscape looked like that. And I can produce a map showing you which road existed, which boundary, um, uh, um, 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 uh, which pile of stone existed, which boundary, uh, 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 field boundary existed. In this way, I can tell you how the landscape looked like. Now, it's very important in order, if you're trying, you're taking the text and you're taking the archaeological artifacts from the event itself. You see, here there is an arrowhead, here there isn't an arrowhead. Here there is an horseshoe, here there isn't a horseshoe. And you can try to understand how people moved through this lang uh, landscape according to the event. But there are also other aspects that you should consider, like 
and I don't see this happening enough or frequently enough in, uh, in historical, neither in archaeological studies. And this is uh, things which relate uh, 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 to information, to, to solar information or to... Uh, um, now, the Wives Ob Wise Observatory in Ramon, in Mitzvah Ramon, this is Tel Aviv University work. You can go into the internet, you pick a date and a time zone anywhere in the world, you put the date that you want, and you get the exact information about, you can go 5,000 years backward, and you can go 5,000 years forward. Any date, they would give you when the sun was rising, when the sun was setting, when the moon was rising, at what capacity of light it was. And this is important information that you hardly find in any archaeological or, histor or even historical studies. Now, for instance, if I take the 3rd of July, remember the Franks are now at Maskana. There is this, there is this night, they're, they're camping over the night, the Muslims are bringing conv convoys and they keep attacking them. If I, can, if I tell you that the sunset was at 6.50 uh, p.m., but then the moon, the moon rised only 14 minutes after midnight, it means that there were quite a lot of, of hours of complete darkness. And when the moon was kind enough to shine, it was shining only in 28% capacity. So this would be an excellent night for maybe sneaking on someone, try, trying to, hang some, to hit someone from the dark. But it wouldn't be the best night for riding a horse, neither to bring convoys from the Sea of Galilee up towards the inner part of the Galilee. So we sort of have to, to look at the task now in a different way. Another aspect which is hardly considered is wind direction and velocity. Now, it's, it's important for the carry of, of fire, of smoke, but it's also important for the distance of, uh, of arrows, for instance. We did a, a little bit of arch experimental archaeology with this <coughs> group of reenactments, reenactors, and we've noticed that when you're shooting, every, it's the, the, the wind uh, um, is very constant, and on, during those specific months of the year, uh, if you take information from uh, agra, uh, agronomic, agra, uh, meteorological uh, centers in the, in the vicinity, you would know that the wind is always, is always play, react, uh, um, um, going in, in, in a very similar ways. And there was 50, minutes, 50 meters different in the distance between if you were shooting from the east to the west or if you were shooting from the west to the east. So this, this is quite a long distance when, when, you have to, uh, when we're talking about the two armies, which are basically the, the boundary between them, between them is those hours that shoot at each other. So this is an important uh, thing to consider. Another thing is, uh, is humidity and humidity and temperature now. Summer, summer is in, in Israel, as, as many of you have experienced uh, personally, can be very, very hot, and we all know it. But in the Galilee, look at the humidity. The humidity can go up to over almost 92% humidity during the night. Now think about those poor crusaders. They were wearing four layers of armor and clothing throughout the day without drinking. Now they'll be sweating quite a lot. And, in the, in, and, if, and at night, the Muslims will still be harassing them. They wouldn't be able to take their clothes off. They wouldn't be able to, to go off their horses. So think about staying wet at, at that kind of humidity. We've tried that. We've tried that. And one of the guys that you see over here managed on the 3rd of July 2010, he managed to get hypothermia. Hypothermia. And now I'm not saying that the Crusaders uh, suffered from hypothermia. They were really, they were mostly very, very um, uh, 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 thirsty. But this is an this is an interesting uh, uh, mark that you should take into consideration. And you know, staying wet with all that clothing throughout the night can really make you. Uh, that wouldn't that wouldn't really uh, contribute to the amount of uh, uh, as to your strength on this, on the next day. Now, the most important part of, uh, of, of the research, or the most important tool that I consider is landscape archaeology, uh, or the landscape, the landscape archaeology survey. Now, usually, archaeologists would look at archaeological sites. In landscape archaeology, the entire landscape is the archaeological site. 
and we study the relations between the different features that build that site in order to be able to reconstruct this site or the landscape to different periods. Now this would be very, uh, very important because it will allow us to understand how the landscape is constructed and then to find those interesting anomalies in the lands landscape. Now those anomalies, for instance, could be a trench on the northern horn. This is a, an aerial photograph from 1945. Now, this is basalt stone, but it's, very, it's a very interesting phenomenon. When you're taking photographs of basalt stones from uh, aerial photographs, everything which is dark is becoming white, you know, at least in those, uh, uh, those periods. Now, look at this, at this circle over here which has no, no stones in it. Now, this is at the highest peak of the Northern Horn. No stones in here. On the other hand, you have a road which is cutting an Iron Age wall over here. So you find these anomalies, and those are usually the, what leads you towards uh, very interesting uh, results. Another interesting tool that we have is photography. And some of you ca just came from, uh, from Shimon's class, from the history of photography, and this is a uh, um, a photograph that was taken by the Bonfis family probably in the 1890s. Now, color photograph. I'm talking about the big one, not the, the, little, uh, the little one that I've, uh, I've added uh, in here. Now, you take those photographs that sometimes are just uh, an amazing resolution. By the way, you can, find, you can download this photograph. It's in the, uh, it's in the uh, Library of, of Congress uh, archives, but you'll have to write Mount Beatitudes in order to find it. Okay, and you can download it in different, different resolutions. Now, you see those boulders over here? I was trying to, to find the right angle so I'd be able to hold this photograph and to look at how much the, the landscape has changed from the 1890s. And I'm holding this, I'm standing between the, between the, between the boulders and I said, oh, so this must have been where the tripod was, was standing off the camera. And then I look to the left and I find a, a sanctuary with a standing stone <laughs> from the late Bronze period and the transition to the Iron Age, a very, very fascinating time in Israel, We're talking about the 12th century BC. And this is a very nice uh, a reconstruction that was made by, uh, by uh, the courtesy of, uh, of Shimon Gibson, but now we're excavating this and we've been excavating this amazing sanctuary. You can see the standing stone over here. We found some pieces of cult stands and all sorts of things. This is also part of the landscape reconstruction, and you get to do some really uh, interesting things. We just realized that it's not only this building that we thought it's a sanctuary from very early sanctuary, just in the landscape by itself, which is attached or which is uh, adjoining those, uh, those boulders, there is actually a whole settlement from that period over there, an unknown settlement. So we, we basically, by trying to find that position to look at the mountain for a, cert for a certain angle, I managed to find with my wife um, an unknown uh, settlement from the late Bronze Age, which is, uh, I find it quite, uh, it's a sort of uh, little things that you're getting. Another thing that, uh, that you'd, uh, I was lucky enough to, um, to be able to do is, um, I'll take you now basically from the springs of Sephori towards the horns of Chitin on the different, different uh, um, um, the road or, say the, or the highway that the, on, the, on the way to of, uh, of the Crusaders to, to hell, as I've titled this, uh, this lecture. So this is an aerial photograph of the Spring of Sephiri, and this road, Road 79, is leading, is connecting uh, uh, the main, one of the main traffics, uh, ma one of the main uh, junctions in, uh, in the Galilee to Nazareth. This is the road where you'll be driving to Nazareth. Now, they've decided to expand it a few years ago, so a huge Israel Antiquities project had taken place. We're talking about, uh, they've, ex they've opened over 200 archaeological squares. We're talking about, uh, about 20 million, about $5 million uh, uh, dollars, uh, project in that area. Now, the guys you will see over here from the Israeli Antiquity, Antiquity Authority, they are two proto-historians. They are, they are usually dealing with, uh, with prehistoric or proto-historic sites, quite early things, but they have noticed that on the, what we call um, um, the ground surface level, started coming a lot of uh, metal artifacts. Some of them they've recognized as crusader because one of them has been to, to one of my lectures uh, just a week before they started excavating. So this is the, the road and different fields, and this is the, 
the areas that they sampled. So we've decided to do a survey along, the, along that road. And what we found is the first crusader encampment. Now, archaeologically, uh, Collingwood already excavated uh, Roman camps in England. And of course, Roman camps, Roman army camps were, were excavated in different parts of the world. But we're talking here about the first, the first ever crusader camp that was ever studied archaeologically. Now those camps, crusader camps, are very different from, from what we know on other camps. And it's a very interesting one because for the first time you can take the text and you can take a text like the um, uh, um, things that the, the Templars wrote, the Templars wrote about in the Templar Code of Arms, how they should, uh, uh, they should uh, set their camps and evaluate it against, uh, against the archaeological uh, finds. Now, up to this point, we found almost 500 artifacts. I think it's 476 artifacts which we can date to the time of the Crusades. Arrowheads, some of them are here, by the way. Uh, later, you guys, anyone who's interested, uh, this will be opened and you, you guys can have a look. Uh, Crusader coin of, Re of, uh, of Baldwin III, horseshoes, and mostly we found quite a lot of horseshoe nails. Now, this type of horseshoe nail is a type of horseshoe nails which came from France. You can find it in southern England and northern France. It's not a local one. It's called, by the way, it has a very nice name. It's called um, a violin key. You see, because of its shape, a violin key uh, horseshoe nail. Now, look at the distribution of those finds. Those are specific horseshoe nails that were found at this location. And it almost, you, it makes you think what, would, what was the main occupation of the Crusaders when they were camping at the Springs of Seferi? What were they engaged on? And I think what was they engaged on is mainly getting ready to, for the battle. And one of the things, you know, they've gathered from all around, from all around the country, from all the ca around the, ki the kingdom. It's a long ride. You want to go to battle with your horse fresh. So you feed him, you give him water, but you also, see, you also change the horseshoe nails. You don't want to have a flat horse when, you, uh, when, you, when you're setting to... Um, uh, uh, so it's almost like you can imagine where uh, uh, the horse was shoed. Now, the different artifacts, it's interesting. Some areas you have this kind of horseshoe nails. Some areas you have different other kinds of horseshoe nails. Some areas you can find things which relate more to our st uh, 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 aristocracy. I brought a couple of buckles which are gilded. It's bronze, but they are all gilded. Now it has to be belong to aristocracy and not to one of the, uh, of the fighting orders, of the, of the military orders, such as the Hospitaller and the Templars, because those were not allowed to put gold over their clothing. So we can almost see in the artifact distribution the different groups that I was talking about which means that already when they were in camp, before they went out towards Tiberias or any other location that they needed to go to, they were already set in different groups. So this model that we found in Seferi, I'm now, I'm now implying it also in other crusader camps, uh, which relate to the Third Crusade and to the march that Richard the Lionheart did from Akko towards Jaffa and from Jaffa towards Jerusalem. Uh, so he, he, it's very interesting. He would always, always camp next to water sources. They would walk for a day and then camp for at least one night next to water sources, probably just as in this case along the riverbed. So it's a very, very interesting. Uh, another thing that we found is a few skeletons with some of the artifacts that you see here around them. And this is, this is probably a crusader because you see how the, the, the arms are, uh, um, unfortunately, the tractor who excavated this, this was, this was done after the, almost when, when the Israeli Antiquity Authority finished their work, crushed the skulls. But you can see the hands like this. This is very similar to other um, um, Crusader cemeteries that we find. And it might relate to another battle that happened two months before the Battle of Chitin. It's called the Battle of Kherson. We knew that it was on a spring on the way to Nazareth. We didn't know which one of the springs. And we might have here we might can say that this is actually the Battle of Crescent actually happened at the Springs of Seferi. Artifact distribution analysis can show us the movement of troops in the landscape because they were shooting, they were fighting and marching. 
and the Muslims were constantly shooting at them. And we can almost follow, this is, uh, the horns of Chitin is here, you can see. Those, this is the volcano, this is the, the plain of Hatin, and over here runs the watershed. You can see, almost see where they've crossed the watershed. You can see where they've moved. You can see where everything ended, okay? So, crossing the watershed, this is, a, this is today a kibbutz which is nearby, and this is a school which is called Hodayot, Lavi and Hodayot. They might have, they probably crossed through here. I, we know that the Muslims were also positioned close by because of the text. And what do we find there? We find their horseshoes, we find horse straps, and this is a very nice uh, pin that was probably used for, uh, for leather. Um, um, a cross guard, I'll show this again. We haven't, find the, we haven't found the whole, uh, the whole uh, sword, of course. You don't find complete swords, that's uh, But you do find things that broke off, like this. And this very, very interesting buckle, or maybe part of, um, of a sword's uh, scabbard. Now, if you look at, the, at this combination, this is almost like finding text. Why? Because you have a buckle here, or, or something else, but on it you can see a coat of arms, and a coat of arms is almost like someone's signature. Now. Whose signature is that? What I see here, some of you might see different things, is a crown, a shield, could also be a heart, but a shield, and an upside down fleur de lis. Now where do we find this co combination of a crown, a shield, and an upside down fleur de lis? We find it on the coins of Raymond of Tripoli's family. Remember, he was leading the forces. He was leading the, his men through the Galilee. And it's very interesting to see, this is um, um, a scabbard of a, of a dagger that was found in Tiberias. In, in Tiberias itself, in, the, in excavations with the, with there. And you can see it very vaguely, but there is an upside down fleur de lis, a shield, and here another fleur de lis. So, but what you can see here on the coins of Tripoli, you can see the shield, you can see the sort of a crown, and then the floor de lis coming on the side. Now, you don't find it in any other families, crusader coins, so we might have this belonged to one of the, one of the people who were part of, the, of, that, uh, of that group that was led by, by Raymond of Tripoli. Now, different kind of conflicts, in different kind of conflicts, you find different kind of archaeological imprint. For instance, if we're having if we would be fighting ballistically, we would shooting arrows at each other, usually you won't find, what you would find is the arrowheads, but people who were hit and animals who were hit were taken away, were taken away to, to the field. But if people were, if you were talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat, then you have pieces of, of, clo of cloth which are falling off somebody, pieces of armor which are broken, pieces of, of weapons which are broken, and it seems like what happened when they've crossed the watershed, is that there was a hand-to-hand -hand combat over there. So we're talking about the, uh, the, the, f uh, with the troops which were led by Raymond of Tripoli were, uh, were having a hard time uh, crossing the watershed. So this could be a little word in his favor. Another possibility is that this is simply completely something else. And they just, they were exhausted. The crusaders were exhausted and they just stripped off their clothes. So what we're finding is, is remains from, those, uh, from, that, uh, from that event over there. Now, I'll, I'll go a little bit further. I got 10 more minutes or, or so? Okay. Um, already William Rye Wilson, uh, a, a Scottish traveler, in 1823, is saying, he's, he's coming to the horns of Chitin, and he's saying, uh, he's describing the, the kind of soil, the very dark soil, basalt soil, but he's saying, what is very interesting that you can see many rock piles, and no, those rock piles might be the graves of the Turks. He's calling them the Turks and the, um, and the, and the Crusaders, which are buried. This, no doubtably, should be uh, Crusader burials. Now, you can still see those rock piles uh, uh, by the horns of Chitin. I've, I've counted, measured uh, over a hundred of those. Uh, and of course, many of them have gone. One of them was particularly interesting because 
Just next to it, I found a coin, which you can see over here, before it was clean and after it was clean. I'm actually kind of sad that I've actually cleaned it. It was much more nicer when it was green. This is a coin of Yusuf Salahadin. Yusuf Salahadin. And this is the first artifact that I found that I could actually relate directly to the Battle of Chitin. The overall project, the field work, took five years. I only did two weeks of metal detecting. The rest of the time was dedicated for the landscape reconstruction, using aerial photography, using historical photography, using landscape archaeology. Only when I knew where there is an area when I can answer a question like, where did they cross the watershed? And I knew that this area is undisturbed. You didn't have a tractor which was walking there or something of that sort. This is what I targeted. And over there, in that specific field, you can find. Unfortunately, I've spent three months excavating this rock pile. Believe me, three months every day. I moved my family to the Galilee. We ex I've excavated this by myself for three months. And I've learned that this rock pile has nothing to do with the battlefield. It's actually dated to the Middle Paleolithic period, which is between 300 to 50,000 years old. And it seems like the stones were gathered by Neanderthals who were living in a cave uh, clear, uh, nearby. This didn't really help my research. Well, it helped because I knew this is a feature which, which I, should, uh, I shouldn't have, uh, I should date it uh, earlier, but it really helped uh, some other PhD students who was looking for the flint uh, uh, um, uh, sources uh, from that cave. And most of those stones over here are actually flint and not basalt. Movement of our armed troops is dependent on our environment, on our, on, our, on our landscape. Now, if we make an experiment now, each one of us has, has his body mass. If we make an experiment and we try to run together out of those doors, of course, we we'll knock each other uh, down. So the same thing in the landscape. If you take big groups of people and you, you've done the landscape reconstruction, now you try to move them through it. Now, if we have a road, for instance, if I'm going, I'm going forward a little bit, this is the highway I was talking about. It's quite a big, this is one of the most, the widest roads we would have from the Roman period, and it still existed. It's still, this you can still, this is Maraika, by the way. Some of you know her, you know her in person. She walks, she helped me a lot in this, uh, in this study. And um, it's 32 feet in, uh, in width. And uh, this is one of the widest Roman roads we have. But still, if we take 1,200 mounted knights, and we take about 5,000 infantry, and we try to fit them on this road, we have a problem. Why? Because you see all those lines which are coming through the road? This is, those fences are part of a coaxial field system that Shimon and I were working on an article on this, were dating to the second century, um, uh, to the second century. So it existed at the time of the battle. Now, those rock, those uh, fences average in height to a meter and a half. So, okay, maybe one horse could jump over them, but definitely not a whole army. So they had to be confined to that road. Now, if that, this is the road which is leaving, leading from Seferi to, to Maskana, to where they camped, it would explain why it took them uh, the whole day to, uh, to get there. They've walked uh, something around uh, 10 and a half miles on, on the first day and why it was so easy for the Muslims to cut them off to different groups. Now you find the same kind of field system also next to Chitin. Can I have a few more minutes or it's fine or? Okay, I won't be offended. So, <laughs> so I'm really sorry about this, but you will find this ver very similar field system next to Chitin. Actually, the only way to cross from the south of the Horns of Chitin, this extensive field system is on this road which is only four and a half meters wide. Now, if up to this point the Crusaders could walk in any formation they wanted, once they have reached this junction over here, crossing this coaxial system, they would have to go in a single line, which would be a perfect place, again, to push them towards the Horns. Now, aerial photography, we can monitor the different differences. And I will just show you. This is the Horn of Chitin itself. And the Horns of Chitin, it's a volcano. This is the northern 
crater of the volcano. This is the, the central part of the volcano. This is the southern horn. It's actually encircled with an Iron Age wall, and a wall which is from the 8th century BC. Now, remember I told you that we didn't know exactly when the, the, the main body of armed knights were abandoned, were abandoned by the infantry. If we look at aerial photography, and even visual photography, we can see that where today you have the entrance into the main crater, it was actually blocked. You see, this is a photograph by Garstang, taken in uh, 1932, if I remember right. You can see that the wall was still complete, which means, and you also you don't find any horseshoe nails or horseshoes on the horns themselves. It means that they couldn't really find refuge between the two inside the volcano. So only the infantry could climb to the volcano and the main and the main and the and the armed uh, the heavily armed knights were actually gathered at this basin below the mountain and this is where this happened and this is my concluding uh, slide so uh, uh, I'll just explain it to you uh, uh, Salah Adin, because of this field system over here and those walls would protect him could be only an arrow shot away from the main scene of the battlefield which occurred here. Now, this is the horns of Chitin, this is the volcano. There is a wall here. Horses could not go up, infantry could. Here you have the field system which is almost working like a net. You know, maybe some people will be able to go through it, but it actually blocks. Over here, I haven't told you, but there are very, very steep slopes, almost like uh, cliff, cliffs like. We have 19th century explorers who had to shoot the horses after they broke their legs trying to go down those slopes. So the whole landscape played to the hand of Salah Hadin. Now, I don't know whether he planned it or not, but basically what happened, it's like a trap. The landscape is a trap. They went into the trap. He shifted them off the main road to Tiberias through that point where I showed you where the kibbutz is today, towards the Lubia plain. They were trapped. And then all you had to do, start fire. Now, the wind direction, I can tell you exactly, he could only lit the fire the moment that they have passed him. Why? Because the wind always blow in summer from west to the east. If he would open, start the fire at any earlier point, he would put himself in, into the fire or even cover himself in smoke, which would be perfect for the crusaders. But so at a certain point, he, he leads on the fire, the fire draws him even closer to the horns himself, and then all he has to do is to finish them off. And on that note, I will finish, and thank you very much, and I will tell you uh, Happy Halloween. <laughs>